Okay, we're continuing our study of the Hebrew language, and we looked at in the previous session the background and history of the development of the language. We looked at the letters, and we begin to look at Hebrew words. And now we want to continue and look at the Hebrew words from another way, in that when you read the Bible, many times a name in the Bible has a meaning, and that meaning is related to the name in many different ways. I'm going to give several examples here. The first example is Hebrew names related to circumstances of birth. In Genesis 4.1, it says, She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And his name, as most of you know, was Cain. And you see the letters here on the left in Hebrew and transliterated English. But most people may not realize that when she said, I have gotten, a man is translated kaniti. It's exactly the same root. I've got, and, and it's used in modern Hebrew to purchase or buy. It's sort of, I've purchased Cain. I've kaniti Cain. Uh, and it's a play on words saying that uh, I've gotten Cain with the help of the Lord, or I've gotten this man, and I'll name him after what the Lord helped me get. So this is the idea of the play on words. Cain. Another example is in Genesis 30, 24, and she called his name Joseph, that was one of the uh, 12 patriarchs, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. Again, in English, you don't catch the subtlety of it. The name Yo Joseph is Yosef, and you see it here on the left, but the name to add is Yosef, Yosef also. It's almost identical. The, may the Lord add to me another son. And so Yosef or Joseph simply means the Lord added another son. And the words here are almost identical except for the vav on the left on the name, but they're pronounced identical. Yosef, Yosef. Another name is the famous name Moses. It said she, the Egyptian princess, named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. In other words, she's giving a reason for the name. The name in Hebrew for Moshe, Moses is Moshe. Some of you might remember the famous Israelite, or not Israeli, uh, General Moshe Dayan. That was, his name was Moses in Hebrew. And then she says at the verb form, uh, Meshitihu. That's, of course, a, it's a combination. I drew him. It adds the him at the end. But if you look carefully, it's the same uh, root, mem, shin, and the hey sort of disappears because it's what scholars call a weak letter in Hebrew. But she's saying, I call this man Moses or this baby Moses because I drew him out of the water. So the name is related. Sometimes you have the name actually related to the circumstances of the ministry. And again, we don't know why they were named that way at birth, but the names seem to fit the ministry. For example, in 1 Kings 18.22, talks about Elijah and says, Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only am left as a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Well, let's think about that for a second. What does Elijah mean? In Hebrew, it is Eliyahu. Eli means my God. El is God, or another name for God, my God. And Yahu is a short form of the Lord or the tetragrammaton, yud he vav he. And so he says here, my God is the Lord. In other words, he's, what he's saying is, my God is not Baal, it's the Lord. And here it's illustrated very directly in the confrontation that Elijah had with the prophets of Baal. Another example is in a book that probably you don't hear taught very often. It's the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's called... Obadiah or Obadiah, and the very first verse says, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. And by the way, you can even derive the name Edom is related to red, um, Adom, but that's not the one I want to focus on. It's on Obadiah himself. It's Obadiah in Hebrew, and it simply means Evid or, or servant or server of the Lord. And there's that short name for the Lord, Yah. And you see a lot of names will have the ending Yah or Yahu, meaning that it's something related to the name of God, Yah, 
or yud hey vav hey ovadya and another example would be in second kings 19:1 this is the famous king hezekiah and it says there as soon as king hezekiah heard it he went into the house of the lord well what does the name hezekiah mean chizkiahu it's related to the word chazak uh, which means strong and there's that same ending again. It was very popular during the time of the Old Testament. The name of the Lord, Yahoo. And so basically he's saying, the Lord is strong. And certainly that was needed and fitted King Hezekiah, who stood up against the siege of the Assyrian army in Jerusalem. Now let's look a little bit more at Hebrew vocabulary. And this is where Hebrew really helps, because we're now going to look at some of the vocabulary related to how this relates to common translations in English. And this is where it really shines, where it's really, really important to know the Hebrew language. The first is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, well, that's very, very familiar with everybody, the very first verse of Genesis. But if you look carefully at the word earth, it's Eretz. Well, Eretz actually doesn't mean earth in the way we know it today. It doesn't mean planet earth. It simply means land. And this is where you have to be very careful because a modern reader would read the word earth and think of earth, the planet earth. But really it just says God created the heavens or the sky and the earth that I see around that I'm standing on. That's more the idea here. And then in contrast, he said, but God called the dry land earth and there again you have to be careful with the translation and literally you really should say god called the dry and part is understood land in other words uh, really the word land communicates it a little bit better land as opposed to water it's not really and even in the context of 110 you can see if he said it's the dry land earth he's not talking about the con the planet earth as a body, but rather the dry parts, the dry land of the earth. But I just wanted to show you how you need to be careful and not read things into this too much. Another example is the word rakia. Is this expanse, or is it even in the more traditional translation, firmament? Of course, in modern English, people probably don't know what you mean by expanse or firmament. One modern translation called it vault. Uh, again, I'll just leave it up to you if that's the best translation or not. But it says in Genesis 1-6, which is the first use of this word, it said, and God said, let there be an expanse or a firmament or even a vault in the midst of the waters. Well, what does that really mean? Uh, it really doesn't communicate an awful lot. But then if we go to Psalm 19-1, that'll help us out because it uses the same word there. In Psalm 19, 1, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Now, it's obvious, to me anyway, that this is a parallelism. He's saying the first part of the verse one way, and then he repeats it using different words. He says, heavens declare, and then it says, the sky above proclaims. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork, what he's done. So this is really a lot of parallels in these two parts of this verse. But the word that he uses is rakia, which basically is a synonym for heaven. And I think some people read too much into it. I've even heard things such as the rakia was really some sort of an ice canopy or something like that. That's really, in my opinion, reading too much into it. I would prefer just to simply translate rakia as a synonym for heavens and just call it sky. And so literally in Genesis 1-6, you could say, let there be sky, whatever atmosphere, but atmosphere is too technical, in the midst of the waters. And that communicates a little bit more clearly what's going on in that verse. Okay, and this is another very interesting example when we look at Genesis 1.14, again, we're still in the creation story of creation. It said, and God said, 
let there be lights and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Well, the word that's used for season is moed. So does it really mean season the way we understand it? Or does it mean appointed time? Because when we think of the word season, we think of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. But that's really not quite what he's saying here because we can look at another verse in Genesis 18, 14. And there it says, at the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. This is the um, incident of the angel and the promise of the son to Sarah and Abraham. But he uses exactly the same word and it's translated at the point in time. It doesn't say at the season, I'll return to you, but it's exactly the same word in Hebrew, moed. And so maybe a better way to look at Genesis 1.14 more literally is, and God said, let there be lights and let them be for signs and for appointed times and for days and years. And appointed times alludes later on to the law in which the yearly feasts of Israel, such as Passover, such as Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, such as Sukkot, or the Feast of Booths. Those were at appointed times that were governed by the sun and the moon. In fact, Passover always occurs on the full moon because it's based on the lunar month, which then fits very nicely with these lights in the heavens are used for the knowing the appointed times of various things such as the festivals uh, in Israel. And one more example, which is sort of a famous example, in the King James Bible, it talks about the famous verse, where there's no vision, the people perish. This is even sometimes quoted by secular people and maybe not even realize it comes from the Bible. Well, the question is, is that really what the verse is saying? Because the word it uses for perish is para, with an ayn. Well, almost everywhere else in the Bible, it has a really different meaning. It doesn't really mean perish, but it means to run wild or out of control. And here's an example in Exodus 32:25. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had made them break loose to the derision of their enemies. In other words, here's the same word, paru, the people broke loose, or para, remember if it's exactly if it's singular or plural, they had, in other words, they'd broken loose, they'd run wild or something, or gotten out of control. And it even says to the derision of their enemies at the end that this was not a good thing that they had done. So perhaps a better translation to go back to Proverbs is literally where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained or run wild because they don't have any direction. They're, they have to have a vision to know where to aim their energies. And without a vision, it's just going to be chaos. And that's probably a better um, word. Now, ultimately, I suppose you could say the King James Version is right, that if you do not, if you just have chaos in a society, it will perish. But the word more literally means to run wild or unrestrained. Now we're going to get from words to thoughts. We've dealt with the alphabet, with the letters and the words, but I think most importantly of all, we want to talk about how does Hebrew express thoughts? One of the big things about Hebrew as opposed to Greek is that Hebrew tends to use physical terms or physical words to express abstract thought. Greek, by contrast, is much more philosophical and maybe some of this derived from classical Greek, which was the language of the ancient Greek philosophers. Hebrew tends not to be abstract. It tends to use physical words to express an abstract idea. And let's look at some examples here. In Joshua 5.1, this is a pretty, even in English you would get the idea of it. It says their hearts melted. Well, a physical heart doesn't melt. It might burn if you have a high enough temperature, but a heart doesn't melt. But that's what they say in Joshua 5.1. Now, it came about when all the kings heard of how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel, 
that their hearts melted and there is no spirit in them any longer. In other words, hearts melted mean inwardly they got really discouraged, really intimidated because they had heard how the Lord had worked for Israel. And now Joshua in Joshua 5 is introducing the period of the conquest of Canaan. And these kings already knew who these Israelites were. They knew how the Lord, and basically they just, they just almost gave up. Their hearts melted, and that's the idea here. They were really, it was something that says there was no spirit in them any longer. They just didn't even have a fighting spirit because they said, what's the point? We're going to lose because the Israelites have the Lord to help them fight. Another example I like is extremely stark. It's not one you hear in a sermon every week because it's quite um, pointed. It says the heart is deceitful and it says the heart is more deceitful in Jeremiah 17 mine than all else it is desperately sick who can understand it Jeremiah is talking about the heart but of course he's not talking about the physical organ that pumps blood he's talking about our inward self our attitudes our spirit the way we think about things and he's warning us that the heart is deceitful. In fact, the Hebrew word that's used there, we won't get into, it, it's the word for bent or distorted. The heart is, some, there's a problem there. It's deceitful. It's, it's not straightforward. And, and so this is another example of, an, of a physical thing, the heart. And we use the heart sometimes even today, primarily I would say because we picked it up from the Bible. And then it says, like a tree. In Psalm 1-3, it says, He, this is talking about someone who walks according to the Lord, He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. He has a picture, a physical picture of a tree, but not just any old tree. This tree has roots, it's firmly planted, and it also is nearby streams of water to give it life so it can grow. And it also yields fruit. But he's really not talking about agriculture here. He's talking about this man and giving imagery, physical imagery, to describe the inward attitude and direction of a man who follows the Lord or walks in the way of the Lord. Another thing in Hebrew expression, which is very interesting, is what we call noun verb repetition. And you, again, do not notice this in English. For example, in Je about plants, in Genesis 1.12, it says, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind. Well, yielding seed doesn't seem any big deal to us in English, but if you look at it in Hebrew, it's quite a bit different. If you look, I'm going to quote the verse in Hebrew. I'm not expecting you to know Hebrew, but I put the key words that are translated in red here. Okay, and so it says, Vatotse haaretz desha esev mazria zera leminehu. Okay, and so here he's saying, mazria zera is a plant word. And if you see the letters, you see that zera is the grass or seed, and mazria is to cause to, sit, to sow, but it's exactly the same uh, root word here the mem, or rather, zain resh ein. And it's a play on words. It's, say, it's like you almost say in English, I've seeded seeds, something like that. But it doesn't sound as good in English. And I wrote it in the bottom in transliteration, mazria zera. Another example with animals in Genesis. In Genesis 1.20, it said, Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth. Well, actually, we have two examples. This is why I highlighted in red both examples. If we look at it in Hebrew, uh, you see again, and I put to the right here, the um, transliteration here, Vayomer Elohim Yishratzu Hamaim Sheretz. Okay, and so you see again, Sheretz is the swarms, and that's a hard one to translate. And uh, Yishratzu is teeming. 
but it's again saying, let the waters swarm with swarming things. But again, that doesn't sound good in English, but that's what it literally means, but because it will bring out the play on words. Similarly, uh, the second part of the verse says, Nefesh haya ve'of ye'ofef al ha'aretz. And again, of is the word to fly, and ye'ofef, now it does repeat the consonant, I don't want to get into the details, it is still the same root, it's just expressed with a repeating consonant here at the end, but it's basically, in English it said, let the birds fly above the earth, but it's literally saying, let there fly the flying things above the earth, and so that you get the play of words. Another good example even is very simple in worship. In Psalm 4, 5, it tells us, offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Just a very simple thing. Again, in English, offer and sacrifice, at best, I only have a vague connection, but in Hebrew, it's very clear. He says here, zivchu zivche tzedek. And there's, a, there's zayn kaf chet, which means to offer. And again, he's using the verb first, zivchu, and then he says, zivche, or zvachim, but this is what's called a smichut in modern Hebrew. It's tied together with the noun following, which is zivche tzedek, the uh, sacrifices of righteousness. Really, what it, if you wanted to get the word play better, you should say sacrifice the sacrifices of righteousness, or offer the offerings of rat sacrifice, that actually would play, but it doesn't sound as good in English style, so this is why they say, say it the other way, but it, that's the way it sounds in Hebrew. Another one is the word trust, okay? Uh, but actually, it's not the word trust, but it's expressing trust. In Psalm 23, 27.3, it says, though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Okay, well, that's the trust of the Lord expressed there, but let's look at the word host and encamp. Again, in English, you miss the play on words. Im tachne alai machane lo yira libi. Okay, and he's saying here that even if um, the encampment, it's the verb form for camp, machane is really the word for camp. It's even used in modern Hebrew that way, or, but we don't really have a verb. We say in camp in English, so it's really a more literal translation is even if a camping, even if the camp is encamping against me, my heart will not fear. Of course, he's referring to enemies, but here it's again the play on words. Tachane and machane. They're the same root, and one is a verb, and the other is a noun. So you see this all over the place in the Hebrew Bible, how they try to emphasize the thought by using noun verb repetition, but it's not repeating the same word, it's repeating the same root. And then finally we get to word play. This in many ways is the most fascinating about Hebrew, where there's actually an element of poetry. In English, we're used to poetry, and we'll be talking about poetry more a little bit later. But in English, we use word play we use rhyming, and in Hebrew, you don't do so much rhyming of words, but you do a little bit in wordplay, like we say, Jack and Jill went up the hill. Well, that's a play, that's a rhyming of words. Hebrew tends to rhyme in thoughts, and we'll develop that more in just a few minutes. But there are a few places where they actually try to have a wordplay on similar words. The first example is a connection. It says in Genesis 2.7, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. Now, again, if you read it in English, you might miss the connection there. But then if you look at it in Hebrew, you see it more clearly. Vayitzer Adonai Elohim et ha Adam. And this is where you get man means Adam, or you get the word Adam. And then he says, Afar min ha Adama. So there's that same root. Adam comes from Adama, and so Adam came from the ground. And we use um, a ground is Adama, and the man Adam came from the ground. So the words are related, but you wouldn't pick that up in English so closely. Sometimes the word play 
is a contrast. And I really like this one. And I have to credit the HCSB translation, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I really thought they did a great job of trying to bring it out in English, but really most translations miss it. It says in Isaiah 5, 7, he looked for justice, but he saw injustice. He looked for righteousness, or, or for righteousness, but he heard cries of wretchedness. You sort of get the idea, justice, injustice, righteousness, and wretchedness, they almost rhyme in English. But that's exactly the point from Hebrew. If we look at it in Hebrew, it says, Ve'ikav le mishpat behine. Um, mispach. In other words, mishpat and mispach are to totally different words, but they sort of sound the same to the ear, and so he's playing on the words, and the HCSB said justice and injustice. And the second part said litzdaka behine tsaaka. And that's even simpler than the translation. It says, for righteousness, daka, but then it says, but behold, there's just shouting. Now they had to do it, but they said cries of wretchedness. And they, and I know why they did that, because it brings out a little bit the, the wordplay. Tzedaka uh, and tzaaka sort of sound the same to the ear. because And they're playing words to emphasize his point. He wants righteousness, he's proclaiming righteousness, but all he got was shouting and chaos, wretchedness, shout, cries of wretchedness. Then there's the analogy. This is where the word play is even more direct because they actually use the same root of the word. And a good example of this is in Jeremiah 1, 11 through 12, where he says, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, that's Jeremiah speaking, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. What on earth is a connection between almond tree and watching over? Well, you wouldn't get it in English, but you do get it in Hebrew. Here it's a little bit longer. Yermiahu, the yomer, makel, that is stick, Shaked, which is almond, aniroe, I see. But then and he continues, Vayomer Adonai Elai Hetevta Lirot. You were good to see. That's good. You saw well. Ki shoked ani al bari la soto. So anyway, he's saying here that you see an almond tree, but the word shoked means to diligently work or to watch over, something like that. So he's saying, you see an almond tree physically, but that's a sign with a play on words that I'm going to um, watch over my word to perform it. So you have the play between shaked, which is almond, and shoked, which means to work diligently or to watch, watch over. Amos is our last example here. It's a very similar one, actually, to Jeremiah. He says here, so it's again an analogy in Amos 8.2. It says, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. And I put it in red here to give you the hint where the word play is in English. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. What on earth is the connection between summer fruit and the end for the people Israel? And this is, of course, a very serious warning to the people. Well, if we look at it in Hebrew, we see what the play of words is. Vayomer, ma'ata ro'e amos. The amar, kluv, kites. Kluv is like a basket of fruit, and kites is summer. But then the Lord says, Vayomer Adonai Eli, ba haketz el ami. And behold, or just uh, the, the end is coming. And so it's a play on words between kites, which is summer, and ketz, which is in. It's actually the same words except for the additional yud. And so this is how there is, this is a good example of wordplay. Now we're going to stop here and continue in the next section on Hebrew poetry, which also shows the structure. But I hope that you've gotten a good idea of how Hebrew really does illuminate the meanings that are sometimes obscured in translation. We'll continue this 
in the next section. Thank you.